Hello, so today we're gonna do a wrap-up video. Um, I'm really inconsistent with wrap-ups, with monthly wrap-ups, because I do reading vlogs, so it feels pointless, but I also realize that not everybody's gonna read, watch every single reading vlog, so maybe doing an end of the month super quick reviews is worth it to you because with my reading vlogs, especially lately, I've been challenging myself to be really thorough with the way I talk about books, just be a better reviewer. I'm trying to be a better reviewer. And so giving you a quick snippet of a book, of all the books at the end of the month, and then directing you to the, toward the reading vlogs if you wanna hear more is maybe useful, I don't know. At the end of each month, I always go through this in my head and then I, sometimes I decide to do it and sometimes I decide not to. Anyway, here's a quick look of everything that I read in the month of January, lots of fantasy. I had plans to read other books too, outside of fantasy, but that is not where my mood took me. So fantasy is where I lived in January with a little bit of literary fiction thrown in there as well. So I also have a chart showing you how I rated everything this month. That'll be at the end of the video, but here's a quick look at everything that I read in the month of January. And there are reading vlogs, Oh, there are reading vlogs attached to every book except for one, and that one got a live stream, where there's far more detail, so there's always videos to give you more. But anyway, everything I read in the month of January, and at the end of the video, we'll also talk about what I plan on reading in February, which is really ambitious. The first book that I finished this month was, I guess you could call it, I don't even know if you would call this a novella. Uh, is an art book? It definitely wouldn't count as a novel. I know that for certain. Um, this is, I, I start all, I start every year off with one of these and it's very short sayings coupled with art. And it's all little, just like each page has a little lesson, a little idea, a little thing for you to ponder. And then you move on to the next page which has its own isolated little idea, but there's a, a running theme that ends up telling a running story at the end. It, it has a full story arc, even though it's a bunch of isolated thoughts. I always enjoy these. These are rarely ever a top book for me of a month, but I do really enjoy them. I think that they're a cozy, sweet way to kick off the year. And while sometimes it's cheesy, a lot of times it's just, just kind of nice. I don't know comforting. This fellow's a cat who goes on a journey, a solo journey, to find an isolated tree that will give him enlightenment, that will help him gain deeper wisdom. And so he's on this journey to find this tree. Along the way, he meets some people, some from previous books, uh, the little dragon from Tiny Dragon, Giant Panda, I think is what that other one was called. Big big panda, tiny dragon. Um, that dragon does show up in this one, which is a previous art book, as well as a little kitten. That's super cute. It was nice. Next book I finished was The Little Unicorn. Something that I challenged myself to do in January is to utilize the library more. My library has a really good catalog of physical books and an excellent ebook catalog. So I'm trying to look at the library first and then purchase, which means that I'm mostly just purchasing new releases and anything that is a little, has a little bit of age on it, I'm getting from the library more. So you'll see a lot of Corey's gonna have to work harder with the edits. Anyway, The Last Unicorn is beloved by so many people. So many people grew up with this book. I didn't. I did not grow up with the book. I didn't grow up with the movie. This was my first time experiencing this story and there's a lot to love about it. This little novel felt so much like a fairy tale, a true fairy tale, not just in the prose, which which was very whimsical, but also in the characters. We're following a unicorn, a unicorn that's perfectly comfortable being solitary, but then she hears that she's the last unicorn. And so she wants to travel to find out if she truly is the last or if there are other unicorns out in the world. And so she goes on this journey to, to figure it out. We have a wizard, we have a king, uh, we have a traveling carnival, a skeleton, a noble prince, there are riddles and poems and songs throughout the story, uh, throughout the narrative. It's just, it felt so much like a fairy tale while I was reading it. Things would just sort of happen. They would just come into the scene, happen, and then leave in that sort of nonsensical, anything could be here with driving themes kind of 
keeping it all together. There's an emphasis on chasing your dreams, uh, finding reality um, uh, among illusions, uh, what you want to be true versus what truly is real and right in front of you. Superficial things like beauty and perfection aren't what we're meant to chase in life and what our focus is meant to be on, but it's a, instead it's about the choices that we make and the way we carry ourselves, the way we conduct ourselves through life and through our relationships, even when, you know, sadness, sorrow, death, even when when difficult things come our way, how do we respond to those things? It's so goofy, it's so silly at times, but it's also very melancholy and really challenges the reader to think and to consider what's happening on page. It's a story that I totally understand why so many people have resonate, resonated with, why it has been really impactful in a lot of people's lives. I don't know if I read it at the wrong time or just, you know, taste very, but it wasn't a new favorite for me. It wasn't like an out of the park hit like it is for so many people, um, but I did enjoy it quite a bit and I'm glad I read it. Next we have the Door to Door Bookstore. This book was such a surprise to me. It's very, very short. It's very reminiscent of A Man Called Ove, if you've ever read that, by Frederick Bachman, one of my all-time favorite authors. Um, so this follows an old man who is a door-to-door -door, door -door bookseller. He, his job is to go door to door and deliver, hand deliver personalized books that are wrapped and ready just for them. And each person that he delivers the books to, they have their own personalities, they have their own, I mean, of course they do, but they have their own stories and their own ways of, it, of interacting with this man, Carl, as well as with the books that he delivers. And there's a young girl, Sha, Shasha, Shasha? Yeah, Shasha. There's a young girl named Shasha. She's nine years old and she shows up. She's been watching him, the book walker. She's been watching him make his deliveries. And then she sort of just weasels her way into his book route and his routine and eventually his heart. And it's their story as they go through and do his routine and then she kind of weasels herself into these people's lives as well and how she impacts them and how they impact each other. There's a couple of things. We had some really good discussions around this book. Um, we, Buddy read this actually in both of my discords, the Patreon one and the public one. And in both of the discords, we had some awesome discussions about some of the things that we felt that the book exceeded at, some of the things where it stumbled. This is easily one of, it's been, it's been such a great Buddy read, not just a great book, I loved this book so much, but it's also been a great buddy read because there's so much to talk about as far as the characters, individual stories, what they're struggling with, how they respond to things, as well as um, where their stories took them and how that was handled in the book itself and how the characters and their stories impacted us. I think also too, the prose is one of the things that I love the most about this book. I, It was written so beautifully. It was written like a Bachman book where something that could be really simple would be said, but because of the way it was said, because of the way it was presented, because it wasn't said in the most blunt, straightforward way possible, it held a much greater impact. It's a book about the power of books and the power of friendship and the power of relationships and the power of what we can be in each other's lives. I loved it. A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking. This was another big surprise for me. This is a middle grade, it's by T.K. Fisher. This is my third book by this author and this was going to be my last um, because the last two books that I've read, I have really liked the ideas, but execution wise, it's never quite gotten to where I feel the book has the potential to get to. And so I just always come away or the last, the other two books, I came away saying, ah, what a great, almost, but just not quite. And so, this was gonna be, you know, three strikes, you're out. Uh, good writer, excellent. Like, I totally understand why people love these books, but just not me. Um, and this book was amazing. <laughs> I loved it so much. This follows Mona, who is a baker, and she she's young. Um, Shasha was nine, Mona is 10 maybe? 14, she's 14, Mona is 14. She's a baker and she loves her simple, very chill life as a baker who has magical powers and a magical sourdough starter. So she has a sourdough starter named Bob that she can, she can, she can magically control baked goods. So she has Bob, the sourdough starter, that bakes like perfect bread and perfect whatever he takes part in, but also she can make gingerbread men dance and perform and, you know, just baked goods. Her magic is around baking. And this is set in a kingdom where 
there's the there's the what what I consider the greater magicians, you know, hurling lightning bolts, defending the city, and then you have the lesser magicians. The way I describe them is incorrect according to how the book ends up unfolding, but that that's a good that's a good entry point for you to understand. And the lesser magicians, the le lesser ma the lesser wizards. I think they're called wizards. Magic users are they just have random magic like Mona who only affects baked goods. Or there's one girl who's mentioned for only a sentence in, in the book, but it still makes me laugh. She can turn rocks to cheese. Um, there's one lady who can animate horse corpses, specifically only dead horses. She can animate them. So like if a horse drops dead in the street, then she can, you know, easily get rid of that sucker. But that also means that she rides around the kingdom on, you know, an undead horse. So the very beginning of the book, there's a murder, uh, a, a young girl is killed in her bakery and Mona doesn't know why, but she finds the body and that, and then she gets falsely accused and then everything kind of goes from there. But it turns out that there's someone who's hunting down the wizards and trying to kill them. And some of them are fleeing and some of them are dying. And Mona is on that list. I loved Mona. She is not the chosen one. She's not heroic. She's just a kid, man. She's just a kid who has very, simple <laughs> abilities that should not be able to defend a whole city and because of her friends and because of because of the people who come alongside her and who fight with her and because of the people that who, who believe in her and who who teach her that magic isn't about your specific ability but it's about the creative ways that you think about using it and because of because of relationships and because of her own ingenuity and and bravery in the face of fear, they're able to, you know, do plot things. So it was so charming. It, it too felt very fairy tale esque, not quite to the extent that the last, the final unicorn did, but last, final, last, last unicorn did, but to the extent of just more like a modern fairy tale. It's a middle grade baker's magic story. I loved the kingdom. It's it's probably my favorite setting of the month. I would live in this world. I would live in this kingdom. I would so happily live here. Ideally after the murderer is handled, but I would so happily live here and give me my random weird magic ability. That would be great. Next is Eric. I have a lot less to say about this one. So Eric is also gonna be on the screen. It's the next Discworld book. I've been reading these chronologically and I've been reading one Discworld book every single month, all of 2023 and January, I'm kicking it off again. However, I will be skipping next month just because I'm, I'm getting a little bit fatigued. So I just wanna take a break so I don't burn myself out. Um, but anyway, Eric, this is the third Rincewind no novel. And in the Discworld universe, there's different, I call them arcs. Um, there's different storylines that you can follow within the same universe. And the Rincewind storyline is not m my favorite. <clears throat> um, although this was a, a good one, probably my favorite Rincewind book. Anyway, Rincewind is summoned and the kid who summons him thinks that he's a demon and he's like, G give me my three wishes. And Rincewind is Rincewind, which means that he's just like, I don't, it's not, that's not what I do. But you know, he's Rincewind, which means that the world conspires against him and he will get caught up in shenanigans whether he likes it or not. So he does end up uh, helping this kid fulfill these three wishes. And that includes going in different time. It means going, it means it's crazy stuff. I especially like the focus on ex reality, not quite meeting expectations. You think you want this great thing, like meeting the most beautiful woman in the whole wide world. And then you meet her. And then it turns out that legends are a little bit more interested in being legends than they are in being honest. And like things like that, that I think are just funny or talking about history and talking about how you know, ask the citizens, they might have a different history to tell you than the heroes who wrote it. Um, so I always enjoy those kind of little things that Pratchett likes to sneak into his books. Overall, this was enjoyable, but it also was, you know, definitely one of the, one of the more midline um, Discworld books for me. Then we have Proven Guilty. I did do a spoiler review for this. So you have the spoiler free reading vlog, but then you also have like 40 minutes of me just like rambling on about uh, this book, which I really enjoyed. So The Dresden Files is a an urban fantasy detective 
uh, he's a private detective who, when supernatural cases happen, when there's a supernatural death, he gets called in and he handles it. So he's a wizard and he's trying to help humans. And that's the premise of the series, but the series is much, much, much bigger than that premise. It's definitely not a detective story of the day uh, sort of series anymore like it was in the beginning. It's gotten a lot bigger, a lot more emotional. The character work in the series is phenomenal. I do have my qualms with it, but overall, I love this series. I was a little bit nervous that this one wouldn't work out and it definitely did have some low points for me personally, um, but overall, I loved this book. I thought that it, it opened up the world even more as each book keeps doing. It had some incredible character work. Uh, there's one particular family that's involved in a lot of the plot lines of this series that we got to dig into a lot deeper from a different perspective. Instead of just focusing on one character in the family and just kind of noticing the other characters, we actually kind of put that character aside and dug into some other members of the family, which I thought was just so, it was such a good choice. <laughs> I, I, I loved it so much. And of course, Harry as well is up to his Harry shenanigans. It's book eight in the series. It's not the strongest in the series, but I ended up really, really enjoying it. Some highs, some lows, but I really, really enjoyed it. The Bloodstones, written by my friend Tori here on booktube. Highly recommend her as a person and her book. So this follows two perspectives. There's Garen who is, who witnesses a really brutal execution and then is whisked away to a certain school setting and his whole life is turned upside down. His identity is challenged and shaped here. He kind of has to, he has a lot of self questions, a lot of questions about who he is and who he's going to choose to be, how much of himself he's willing to set aside for who, uh, for the directions that are being pushed on him. And then we have Sindri who comes from uh, an area where, so this is, all, this is all taking place during a war. And for Garen, this is like his, this is experiencing war in this way is traumatizing and shocking and, and alters his life. And for Sindri, war is a part of her life. It's a part of where she comes from. It's a part of who she is. And killing for her people is a part of what she does. But for her as well, identity and what you're willing to sacrifice and the changes you're willing to make are a big part of her story too. This is set in ancient Japan and while the story is, is pretty focused on one area, there's a lot of promise for us expanding that and going a lot wider and exploring a lot more as the series continues on. I personally, I loved this book. I think that Tori did such a good job of taking typical fantasy tropes and things that we're used to seeing and lulling us into a sense of false security where we're like, oh yeah, okay, I know this one. And then she just kind of twists it and does something totally unique and special for her story. Her character work is phenomenal. And I just, I really, really loved this. Uh, I did a live stream with Tori talking to her about it, spoiler free. So if you're interested in hearing more about this book, I do highly recommend that live stream because Tori had a lot of really great stuff to say about the book and about what to expect from the series as well. Next, I read Throne of Jade, Jade, which is the sequel to His Majesty's Dragon, which was probably my biggest surprise of the year last year. I expected to DNF that book. I didn't think I would like it at all. And it ended up being incredible. So um, I read book two this month and I really enjoyed this as well. I didn't enjoy it as much as book one, but I do think that what it did do, it did phenomenally. And it was a key essential part of the relationship, the core relationship of the story. So what the story is, is we follow Lawrence, who is a naval man fighting for the British Navy um, and during the Napoleonic Wars. Gosh. Anyway, they end up seizing a dragon egg and it hatches and bonds to Lawrence and Lawrence's life turns upside down and Lawrence and Temeraire, the dragon, um, turn into dragon riders. <laughs> and they, well, I mean, Temeraire is the dragon. They have to enter into a whole new culture of what, how dragons and their riders live and interact and what their role is in this time and history. And it's just, it's this stepping into a new world, discovering a new relationship, forging new bonds. I loved it so much. And in book two, um, the Chinese empire is mad because, you know, Timurer was their dragon egg and they're like, hey, give it back. <laughs> and so they want to sever the bond and Lawrence fights for their bond and for their relationship. And they traveled to the Chinese empire to plead their case and to try to be able to continue to be uh, dragon and writer. So there's some travel, there's a lot of slower uh, moments, but there's also a lot of smaller conflicts. Like in book one, there's warts to fight, there's battles to fight. And in book two, it's like, do we work still? Like, 
are we the best fit for each other? And learning that even though they're not exactly the same, they don't see the world the same way, they're not gonna forge all the same bonds, they're not going to want all the same things, learning how to grow together and not apart in the face of those differences and as life goes on. So their bond deepened so much. Um, this is such, I love this series so much. I love these characters so much. I love how they challenge each other. I love having Temerer uh, looking at Lawrence and the things that feel normal to him in society and in war times and saying, but why, why? is this considered okay? Why do you do this? And why is this the fate thrust on us? And what if I say no? Excellent sequel. I did like book one better, but I loved book two and I'm very excited for book three. We're reading these once every other month. Then I read Sons of Darkness, which is set in ancient India and it follows. So the, uh, the author's note says that it is, it's following the Maharabata um, with some twists, specifically some grim dark twists. Um, st series like A Song of Ice and Fire, The First Law, Malazan are big inspirations for how he's taken this core story for Indian culture and and he took this these characters and this story and then he kind of uh, played with it in using these inspirations. I looked up some videos to familiarize myself a little bit with the Maharabata and then dove into this. And it was very daunting and overwhelming at first. At the beginning, it's a lot of characters. It's a lot of lore. It's a lot of grit, a lot of darkness. And at first I was, I couldn't find an anchor point. I couldn't find some, I couldn't find a character that I was like, you, I like you. It was just, it's a lot of, it's a lot of moral gray, a lot of people doing whatever. And you know, Abercrombie one of my all time favorite authors. <laughs> and there's a lot, like the Abercrombie inspirations are strong in this book, but yeah, the first 200, 175 pages were rough. But I ended up really, really latching onto some of the characters. Specifically, there's a pirate princess <laughs> that I really, really loved, but several other characters as well. The magic is very subtle in this, but uh, so intriguing and I think there's promises that we're gonna get a lot more of it in the sequels. And when the perspectives start coming together, when I realized where we were going and what we were doing and when it all started kicking off, the second half of the novel is action-packed and thrilling and so many twists. There's so much happening and there were times where I was like, breathe, breathe Murphy, breathe <laughs> as I'm reading crazy things going on, betrayals and battles and it got really, I mean, it got really great. I do have some strong criticisms or complaints or like things that didn't work for me in the book specifically with how much the inspirations were worn on the sleeve of Gaurav to the point that it felt like certain characters or scenes were actually lifted from the first law or other books and then placed here, as well as certain perspectives and characters that I think if they had been brought more to the front side of the story, then the story could have been easier to get into. At first I was like, I don't know that I'm gonna like this. I don't know that I'm gonna finish this. And I'm glad I stuck with it because it ended up being a really enjoyable read, but you know, it was a tough start. So I have some mixed feelings about it, but for a debut and for the beginning of a series, I really liked it. I loved the way it ended. Those are all the books that I completed this month. Now, let's talk about what I'm currently reading and what I DNF'd. So I have just started A Drop of Venom, which is a YA fantasy following a young girl who I think, I just started it, so forgive me if I'm really wrong, but I think she gets pushed into a, vit, a pit full of vipers, bitten up to bits, but survives. And now she's essentially Medusa. But it's like, it's Indian lore tangled in with the Medusa myth. Anyway, my niece is interested in this, but it does contain, I mean, the preface, the author's note at the very beginning warns you. Thank you, author. Thank you, Sanji, for doing that. Nobody does that, that's not true, but it's not common enough, especially in YA. Anyway, the author's note warns you that there is an on-page sexual assault. So I'm pre-reading this for my niece to see if it's a good one to pass on to her or not. It's under 400 pages. I have three and a half days left in the month, so I think I probably will finish it in January. So um, my reading vlog that goes up on Thursday, I'll probably have some thoughts for you in that. I'll probably have it done 
for that, I would think. We'll see. I'm also currently reading Reaper's Gale. By the time the month is done, I will be done with part two. I've been reading this. I've been telling you that I'm reading this for months now, but I keep picking it up, reading a little bit, and then just being like, I just, it's just not clicking for me anymore. And I just kept kicking the can down the road because I don't want to force myself to read a Malazan book. It just, I was not, I don't know if I wasn't in the right headspace or if I just needed a break or what, but this month I finally picked it back up and was like, it's time. This is all working. This is how I'm supposed to feel during a Malazan book. It's time for me to be reading this now. So I went back to the beginning, restarted it, reread what I've been kind of plucking away at for months, have loved it, and I'm now almost done with part two. So I will for sure have a review out for you in February. I've been promising the review for a long time. Thanks for being patient, but I don't want to force a Malazan book. I want to enjoy these. I want to, I want to read them at the right time. And this is finally the right time. So I'm reading that. And then I, oh, and then that's all I'm reading right now. And I DNF'd, so I, I quit on probably my most anticipated book of the month of December, which was Cage of Souls. <laughs> it's a sci-fi book. Uh, the world is dying and we're exploring it, I think. Um, I got like five chapters into it and I just, the writing's beautiful, but I just couldn't care about anything. I just felt like, I felt, what, what are we doing? What's the point? What, like I could not find a direction or an anchor point or anything to care about. And I just had other books that I would rather be reading. So I quit on it. I might give it another go someday in the future, but for now I have other books by this author that I wanna be reading that I think I will enjoy more. So final ratings for all the books. I didn't have, the only book that was a just straight three star was Eric, um, the Discworld book. And then everything else on the three star row was a 3.5. And then some fours and fives. I typically don't give out a lot of twos and ones because usually if I'm not enjoying something, I just quit. So this month was a very good reading month for me as far as my enjoyment goes. I read a lot of really great books and I hope that you don't, this is long. This is supposed to be like a 10 minute video. Oh well, hopefully there's something in here that interests you. You can check out more videos where I talk more in depth about these books, even though I ended up doing a very poor job of doing really quick reviews or you cannot. <laughs> But let me know if you plan on picking up any of these books or if you've read them and you want to talk to me about them. I'd love to hear it. If you want a quick look at what I plan on reading in February, this is it. I've, you can pause the screen if you want to see it. I know it's stacked. I know it's overpacked. But I pushed five books out that I wanted to read in February to narrow the list down to this. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read. <laughs> Anyway, I post videos every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday on this channel, Mondays and Fridays on the manga channel, always linked in the description. I'll see you again soon. Bye.